final lecture, yes. right? For Xu's final lecture. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, continue our discussion of um, the CFT with uh, uh, only scalar prime, uh, scalar versor primaries. That was a very, that was a very special theory. So, uh, okay, maybe I'll start in the middle here. So, uh, uh, considering 2D, uh, remember this, this was this, the second example I'm going to discuss is the the cross equation. So, so a unitary CFT uh, with um, only scalar, uh, that is H equals H tilde for all the primaries, we are sorrow primaries. Um, and um, I showed, uh, with a small caveat, um, that um, um, modular invariance at the level of the torus partition function uh, implies that um, the spectrum is continuous. Um, so, so let's say uh, uh, H equals H tilde um, takes uh, uh, value between c minus 1 over 24 over its infinity um, and the special uh, the sum over um, uh, uh, the weights uh, the sum over the primaries in the partition function is now replaced by some continuous integral from this infinity with some special density which is unambiguously determined by modular invariance up to overall normalization and uh, in fact, um, uh, this row uh, is an easy exercise <coughs> from last time. Uh, I didn't quite finish, but this goes like 1 over square root of h minus c minus 1 over 24. Um, now there's a, um, uh, let me use a slightly different way to parameterize this. Um, recall uh, our convention of writing c as 1 plus 6 q squared. This, this was useful in writing uh, this formula for HRS. Um, um, and uh, let me write H to be, so in other words, C minus 1 uh, over 24 is Q squared over 4. So let's write, I'll write H to be Q squared over 4 uh, plus P squared. Uh, and P is a uh, non-negative real number uh, for the spectrum of this theory, whatever that is. Um, and um, this form of uh, the square density is basically the statement that the uh, actual operator spectrum has a flat distribution in terms of this parameter p with the uh, uh, uniform density. Okay, so um, so if such a theory exists, I will label uh, the Virasoro primaries by uh, I'll just call them Vp. Uh, these are the primaries. So P now it just ranges from 0 to infinity. So P is a primary uh, of weights H equals H tilde equals Q square over 4 plus P square. And now let me assume that there's one uh, such primary for each P. Uh, now because it's a continuous family, I would like to normalize the two-point function. Uh, and in this case, it's appropriate to normalize it um, by delta function normalization, uh, like so. And then I would be able to, uh, again, rewrite write the OPE uh, in terms of uh, three-point function coefficients. Um, but now, instead of having a sum in OPE, I'll have an integral. So let's say V, P1, as Z, Z bar, V, P2, for some P1, P2, at zero, uh, the OPE, well, right, equal, um, there's infinity, V, P3, of some coefficients C, P1, P2, P3, um, oh, uh, ignore that part of the board for the moment. Uh, z to the uh, minus, uh, just matching the dimension, you'll find minus q squared over 2, minus 2p1 two squared, minus 2p2 two two squared, plus 2p3 squared, vp3, 0, uh, plus, that's the primary, uh, whose coefficient is fixed to be this. Uh, this is three-point function coefficients, plus your um, uh, sorrow descendants of that primary, uh, which, uh, as we know by now, is contribution to, say, the four-point function will be controlled by the conformal block, uh, which I have studied last time. Okay, so um, <coughs> now the crossing equation 
uh, the four-point function would have to obey uh, now takes the following form. So the four-point function, uh, right, between, let's say, between 1, 2, 3, 4, labeled by, these are, let's say, VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4. Uh, this four-point function will have a conformal block decomposition, which now is a continuous integral over this entire family of um, Virasoro primaries. Integral, uh, I'll call this intermediate guy P. And then, uh, so this four-point function in written in formula would be integral from zero to infinity, dP of C, P1, P2, P, C, P3, P4, P, and some uh, conformal block which uh, I'll write uh, as a mod square because h and h tilde are the same thing. Um, h4, uh, intermediate h, which is again q squared over 4 plus p squared uh, z mod squared. So there's another factor involving z bar. I write like this. Uh, one should be careful that if we want to discuss, uh, let's say, the continuation of this into Lorentzian signature, it will no longer be the mod squared. But so far, you, you can have signature this is a correct formula. Uh, provided that this, uh, all these operators are scalars, because so h tilde is equal to h. Otherwise, for the f bar, I have to put the h tilde. Uh, I'm sorry? Sorry, what's, what's different? I mean, the, the measure for the integral over p. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, here, well, um, uh, here, uh, the, the measure is 1. This measure factor is 1. Right. So, so here, uh, I use the same uh, um, uh, measure, and then there's some coefficients. I mean, th this really comes from the normalization, my normalization convention here. So once I tell the function normalize it, uh, you just, uh, uh, I mean, it, it follows from this OPE. <coughs> okay. Um, so that's in principle how you would compute. Uh, by the way, uh, as I emphasized before, this theory doesn't have a normalizable SL2 invariant vacuum, which is why there's no weight zero state in here. And if, that's, if that theory really exists, uh, it would look like the formal function would be decomposed like this. Um, <coughs> the intermediate internal primaries that I, we sum over or integrate over uh, still starts at the value uh, c minus 1 over 12, uh, over 24. Okay. Uh, but now the crossing equation imposes a very non-trivial constraint that this should be equal to this. Uh, so, uh, so this, if I write in formula, that means that the crossing equation says that this should be equal to this guy um, with uh, um, one. And, uh, let's see, one and three switched. One, yes, p three, p two, p c, p one, p four, p. And here, um, we again switch 3 with 1. Um, and um, z is then replaced by 1 minus z. All right, so this is a very non trivial uh, set of equations that will hold for all values of z. Um, now, you can wonder whether uh, you can ever find a solution to this equation. And amazingly enough, there is a solution which I write up here. Uh, so uh, the top formula is uh, uh, these OP coefficients. Um, uh, the formula for this OP coefficients, where this upsilon sub b, the b is, uh, I forgot to write, as we have used before, q is defined to be b plus 1 over b. That's the same b that appears in the formula for hrs. That's the sub square b here. So given this, the q is b plus 1 over b, you can define this. Um, uh, Upsilon function, also known as the Barnes double gamma function, is defined uh, in the range if the real part of x, its argument, is uh, between 0 and q. Uh, this integral converges to define the function, and then you can um, and then continue this to the rest of the complex plane. It turns out to be an entire function uh, with, um, generically with simple zeros um, uh, at some locations. Um, in fact, for now, let me not even discuss the analytical property of this function too much. Uh, some, some Resident formula in the lecture notes. Um, um, let me, I'll just make a few comments. So this formula was uh, first discovered by uh, Dorn, uh, Otto, and by uh, the Zolotchkovs. Um, uh, around the, uh, around 94, 95, um, it's called the DOZZ 
formula. Um, uh, I wrote this, uh, if you look at their papers, uh, the formula looks slightly different from what I'm writing here. They differ by some um, uh, phase factors, actually, uh, which, uh, and the difference of that is because I used a slightly different normalization convention as was in those papers, but this is a more natural convention for my purpose. Uh, uh, now, that formula was, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the formula was derived not by solving the crossing equation directly. That is an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, it was solved by analyzing the so-called Liouville theory. So, in fact, <coughs> um, this spectrum I just described to you, um, together with these OP coefficients, completely determine a consistent CFT. Uh, this, this CFT is known as Liouville th CFT. Liouville CFT. Um, <coughs> so, um, uh, let me just tell you uh, what this theory would look like in the conventional Lagrangian description, uh, if that gives you more psychological comfort. Yes? So, before, uh, one loser derivation of rho h is a constant. There's an overall constant, yes. That's, un that, that's uh, ambiguous. You, you, you can't fix it because um, you can choose, choose that constant to be anything. It will solve all the consistent requirements that I'm demanding here. Uh, well, <coughs> uh, strictly speaking, the storage parent function has a divergent factor in front. So um, uh, now, um, uh, so indeed, so in this case, the overall normalization of the spectral density is not fixed, and uh, um, uh, but that, that's always the case for these kind of non-compact CFTs. Now, um, I may or may not have time to <coughs> comment uh, later on the connection between this kind of non-compact CFT, where the spectrum is continuous, uh, to uh, compact CFTs. So sometimes uh, it can happen that uh, if you have some family of compact CFTs with some moduli of exactly marginal deformation, you can tune these parameters, and in some particular limit, the spectrum become degenerate. And uh, <coughs> so uh, the spectrum become denser and denser above some gap, um, and uh, this non compact CFT will be a, a description of uh, that approximate continuum in that singular limit. So, so, so the divergence of the parent function is actually expected in that case, it was, it it's an overall divergence coming from a uh, divergent uh, density of uh, states. So I think for different constant, uh, uh, you essentially, yes. So uh, essentially, yes. So <coughs> is this a unique solution to this? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you something about that. Uh, yes, conjecturally, it is a unique solution. I'll tell you about the evidence for the conjecture. Um, it was not proven, but. Uh, um, but uh, there's numerical evidence for this. I'll tell you how, to de how this numerical evidence was, was found in, in just a moment. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, the Liouville theory uh, in the Lagrangian language will be described by a single field in, um, uh, with an action, uh, alpha stands for Liouville, um, so uh, if you, in order to describe this as a CFT, it's useful, it's convenient to uh, think about this theory not just in Euclidean space, but put it on a curved, slightly curved background. The reason for doing that is because if I just write on a Lagrangian for a, um, some field theory in flat space um, and try to derive the stress energy tensor from a Lagrangian, there's ambiguity uh, from the Noether's procedure. Um, and this ambiguity uh, will, lead to a different, will lead to different stress energy tensors and uh, different stress energy tensors will dictate different kinds of conformal transformation on the fields, and it will define different CFTs. Um, an unambiguous way to fix that is to say how you would couple the theory to a background metric. So that will unambiguously fix the stress energy uh, tensor. Any kind of ambiguity will come in from cover coupling to curvature in the background. Um, so in this case, um, in a background metric GMN, in 2D, I write like this, plus Q, R, phi, the Q is the same Q, R is the 2D uh, scalar curvature of the background metric, and plus some um, mu coefficient times a um, potential uh, term e to 2B phi. Um, so um, if you didn't have this, uh, this Lagrangian uh, is uh, uh, free, defines the so-called linear dilaton th theory. Uh, the linear dilaton theory is not, strictly speaking, a consistent CFT by my criteria, because the OPE do not close um, if you want to impose uh, modular invariance. Um, but um, if you have this, um, <coughs> then uh, uh, it turns out that this defines a good CFT. So uh, one way to motivate this is that 
if you view this uh, potential term as a deformation of this linear dilaton CFT, um, uh, it would look like a marginal operator. Uh, but it takes some uh, work to justify that that actually defines an exact conform field theory. So the, this marginality is not spoiled by uh, uh, renormalization, uh, and that's not completely trivial to, to justify. In particular, um, it's not a priori actually clear that you can think of this exponential um, uh, uh, scalar potential as a quote unquote deformation because <coughs> it really changes the spectrum of theory. And just like in quantum mechanics, if you start with a particle in a, in a line and then you add a exponential potential that will change the spectrum. <coughs> so, um, uh, but you can study this, um, you, can, you can literally just put this theory on the cylinder by the conformal transform and do canon canonical quantization. You can write down the Hamiltonian for this and try to quantize it. Um, and uh, if you do that, you would say that on the, so let's say this is space, sigma, this is tau, uh, you would say that this field has some Fourier expansion to Fourier modes, like so. <coughs> um, uh, and you can treat this as a quantum mechanical system whose degrees of freedom are these phi ends, these Fourier coefficients. Um, now, if you uh, focus on the zero mode, phi zero, is subject to this potential, uh, v, call this, this guy v, of phi. And so at least in some uh, naive approximation where, where you put a theory on the cylinder, uh, and it, let's say, suppose you can ignore the non-zero Fourier modes, then you call that zero mode, it's just a quantum mechanical system with a uh, exponential potential like so. And we now all know how to solve the spectrum of that quantum mechanical system. We just have uh, waves come in and reflect it back out. So all the states are reflection, um, uh, are um, scattering states. Uh, and of course, the energy of that state will translate into the conformal dimension of the operator, Vp. The p is nothing but the momentum of the asymptotic scattering state. So that's an interpretation. Uh, but from this description, it's a little hard to get an exact formula that will take some uh, non-trivial insight, which I will not explain in detail here. Yes? How is the potential bounded? Uh, how is the potential bounded? What do you mean? It's, uh, it's it goes to zero on one side, goes to infinity on the other side. Uh, sorry. Uh, what happens to the linear term? Oh, uh, well, the linear, ah. And, uh, well. Sorry? Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's correct, because the linear term is uh, proportional to background curvature. There's always one condition. There's always, always one condition that this action is not low, not have a low. Well, uh, if you want to put this on a space of negative curvature, uh, viewed as a conformal field theory, the proper way. So first of all, you know there are various ways you can regularize uh, and renormalize this uh, uh, this Lagrangian. Uh, w if you choose a bad regularization, it may not be conform, may not define CFT. So if you already know that you choose a correct regularization so that it defines a CFT, you put it on some arbitrary curve background, uh, you want to perform a conformal transformation to put it into the standard, let's say Euclidean disk with some boundary condition. And now there's an interesting question of what kind of boundary condition will be allowed, but that's beyond the subject of my lecture. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so um, that's the second example, and now I'm going to tell you a bit about um, uh, the question I was asked earlier, uh, whether this uh, solution is unique, and how can we possibly uh, address such a question. Okay, um, so um, uh, for simpl simplicity, let me analyze um, the uh, four-point function of uh, four identical primaries. Uh, let me call it just call, call them all of them phi, once again. <coughs> um, and the crossing equation, uh, as you have seen there, uh, would be now written in the following form. So um, uh, let me write like this. So the crossing equation would be of the form, pictorially, you'll like to look at this, 
So some sum over some primary labeled by k and should be equal to this. Uh, and uh, in formula, I would write sum over uh, k, ck squared, where ck is the OP coefficient of a primary label by some index k in this OPE. Because all these external operators are the same, I won't keep track of the external index. Um, <coughs> some uh, internal primary, uh, well, so the component block, which depends on the weight of the internal primary, uh, which will be, let's say, hk, and depends on the cross ratio z, and f bar, uh, hk tilde, z bar, generally. Um, uh, so uh, the, this, uh, the, the, the uh, component block decomposition in the cross channel uh, is now the same thing here, just with z replaced by 1 over z, because all the external weights are taken to be the same for simplicity. So um, then I have 1 minus z for h tilde k, 1 minus z, is equal to 0. So this is a crossing equation. <coughs> Uh, uh, this is uh, in general. This is, this is a general discussion. I'll, re I'll return to the Liouville in, in a second. Uh, I want to discuss a general class of uh, treatments of the uh, cross equation um, in trying to understand how it constrains the spectrum of uh, the component field theory or, or how it constrains the spectrum in, in within the given OPE. Okay? <coughs> um, so, a, uh, a standard way to turn this into a um, more manageable problem. Okay, so first of all, uh, what, what we're after is we want to understand uh, the constraint from this equation on the spectrum of the theory as well as the OP coefficients just from the fact that there's this equation and those coefficients here are positive numbers. In the unitary CFT, the OP coefficients in the appropriate basis will be real and this OP coefficient squared appears here which is positive, which, which is non-negative. <coughs> so, um, in order to, so we want to turn this into uh, some kind of a set of linear constraints which it already is on this set of positive numbers. Um, uh, and um, in practice, it's useful to expand, uh, <coughs> to do just the Taylor expansion around a crossing invariant point, sorry, a bar here, crossing invariant point, which is z and z bar both equal to one half. Um, so that's easy to do uh, by taking derivatives. So let me, so, so I can turn this equation into the following equation. Um, sum over k ck squared, we call fm hk fn hk tilde equal to zero, where fm of h is defined to be derivative back to z, the cross ratio to the mth m times, uh, evaluated as z equals one half of f component block as function of the internal weight and z. I'm, uh, I, I'm omitting the external weights here, of course, because, uh, 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 well, uh, but if, even though the conform block of, of course still depends on external weight as well as external charge. Uh, so this will be true for m n, both the negative and m plus n, the odd number. Because you get the uh, minus 1 to the m plus n from acting on this. So, so if I take m plus n to be odd, then <coughs> uh, these two terms give the same contribution to this derivative, and I just get this. So this is m derivative in z, n derivatives in z bar. Um, <coughs> okay. Um. Now, In fact, um, just to uh, use a shorthand uh, notation, let me, uh, I'm going to de denote this whole thing by f upper mn as a function of h and h, h k and h tilde k, just so that I don't have to write this separately. Okay. <coughs> um, now let me define the following object. Um, 
suppose I look at the four-point function itself. Um, uh, let's give this a name, actually. Uh, I will call this now uh, G uh, Z Z bar. <coughs> so writing a G Z Z bar as a conformal block decom decomposition like this, um, if I want to determine uh, these OP coefficients somehow, um, that's uh, the same as the information uh, I would obtain if I know uh, what is the contribution to the four-point, what will be the contribution to this four-point function if I truncate the sum up to some dimension. Yes? So when you do this expansion, why, so is this formula then fixed to an end? What I'm, what I'm saying is that if I literally take the left-hand side of the equation and take m derivative with back to z and n derivative with back to z bar, it still holds. Oh, so and just evaluate that as z can z bar equals one half and get this. I see, I see. <coughs> okay. Um, so um, let's say I'm going, going to now de define something I call a spectral function. Uh, in physics, there are many, many things I call special functions. So th this, this terminology only works in this lecture. <coughs> um, f of delta star is defined to be, um, uh, so I do the conformal block decomposition. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm going to write the decomposition just um, as a sum over left and right weights. Uh, it's essentially the same as this, except that, of course, there could be uh, degenerate primaries of the same weights, uh, same set of weights, but uh, I'll group them together because all, eventually all I'm, all I'm going to need is the positivity and property of the OP coefficient squared. So with the loss of generality, I can, I can write like, like so. <coughs> um, uh, F, uh, in fact, let me write this as F. Uh, I guess in my notation, this I can call it F00. Uh, H, H delta. So this is a conformal block without uh, taking derivative. Just evaluate as, uh, at uh, um, uh, um, uh, at z and z bar equals one half. Uh, now if I if I do that, this would be the same as g one half one half. But now I'm going to make a truncation. Uh, I say that the sum of these has to be um, less than or equal to, uh, let's say, uh, delta star. Uh, and I will normalize this by dividing this by the full four point function. <coughs> All right. So if I didn't make this res restriction, then the numerator and the denominator are the same. So that would be just equal to one. Um, a property that uh, uh, I haven't actually mentioned so far, but it was actually obvious from um, uh, what I discussed last time in the pillar representation of the conformal block, is that the conformal block itself actually um, always take positive uh, values uh, for real value of z, real value of z because zero and one. This follows from the positivity of this an coefficients in the expansion of the powers of q that I mentioned on, on in the pillow frame. So, uh, so these quantities actually are always positive, for positive for when, when they're at, at least when the weights obey the entirety bound. Um, so uh, therefore, this quantity I defined is uh, going to be a monotonic function in this cutoff weight delta star uh, ranging from 0 to 1. So, <coughs> in the actual CFT, let's say if you have some vacuum, you collect, you know, it, it should be some, some kind of monotonic function. Now, of course, if the spectrum is discrete, then this thing uh, is going to be of the form of some step function. It's going to like jump like, like this, maybe, uh, but eventually as, as, asymptotes to 1. Uh, if the spectrum is continuous, uh, but in non combined CFT, it could be of some form like this. Okay? Um, now, it is evident from what I've described so far that, um, uh, is still there. let's say you take the external operator to be the same. Uh, if you know the special function, then you know the OP coefficients up to over normalization by taking derivative. So, this contains really the same amount of information in this context. Okay. Now, the reason that I define this is that um, there's actually a, a useful way to uh, bound this uh, numerically uh, just from the positivity of these coefficients. So let me explain that. Since you're first chemist, you should know you can have more time. Oh. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, one more time, meaning. Uh, Four times the life. Uh, oh, okay. Well, uh, okay. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not in a huge rush at the moment. Not yet. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So um, uh, to um, okay. So so to see um, how we can uh, put some constraints on the special function um, from. Uh, the cross equation, uh, let's consider the following inequality. <coughs> so I'll write this down and then I'll, we'll understand uh, what, what it's good for. So suppose I take the step function. Um, uh, so this is as a function, well, this is a step function that takes the value of 0 if the argument is negative and 1 if it's positive. Um, so it will, will keep, uh, well, it's 1 if the dimension delta is less than delta star. I, I always write delta to be h plus h tilde. Now, uh, of course, um, uh, in this way of defining it, I will not be keeping track of the spin uh, because I'm just truncating on the over di overall dimension. Uh, you can modify this definition, but uh, since I'm going, going to soon apply this to liberal theory, uh, in which case uh, h and h tilde are equal, this is good enough. <coughs> um, let's consider the following inequality. Uh, some coefficients y0, 0, and some m plus n odd mn no negative um, y mn f mn h h tilde divided by f zero zero h h tilde. Recall f zero zero is positive. Uh, and I'm going to demand that this is um, suppose I have a CFT that obey uh, I have a, a CFT where the uh, four point function of some operator obeys the cross equation. And then um, I would then uh, demand uh, that the following inequality is satisfied for for all h h tilde uh, in the spectrum. Um, for some, <coughs> so this is uh, given given delta star. Uh, we will seek uh, real numbers numbers. Uh, y0, 0, and ymn, where m plus n is odd. Uh, now, the sum, I could truncate the sum to any finite set of values m and n, or I can include all values. It doesn't matter at the moment. So, um, now, I don't know whether a priori I can find the number such that this is satisfied. But for now, let me su suppose that I can. Okay, suppose, suppose there exists uh, a set of values y0, 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 and ymn, such that this is uh, all obeyed. Um, then, um, if I um, now, uh, so this, let me call it star. This is this inequality. Um, uh, now, if I uh, sum over uh, uh, H, and H, H in the spectrum with C uh, OP coefficient squared um, times um, F0, zero, 0, H, H tilde, which is also positive, uh, then times this equation star. Um, uh, okay, maybe I should call the left hand side uh, star. Maybe, maybe uh, the, the left hand side is this star. So this will still be uh, the negative, obviously. Um, but what do we get here? Now I've arranged this so that this thing will cancel against this. Uh, and if I sum up this fmn with c squared, uh, that's supposed to be 0. That was the content of the crossing equation. Okay, so if I do the sum, then all these terms, each one in the sum, will cancel out. As I said, the sum can be any finite set of integers m and n, such that m plus n is odd. Okay, so, so this part is gone once I do the sum. Um, so I re it remains to analyze these two terms. Uh, but uh, you see that. Uh, what I get is that if I, this y0 is, a con is, is just a number. So, so then the sum gives me um, the four point function uh, at uh, cross ratio one half. Uh, and if I do this sum, I just get a truncated four point function at the cross ratio one half. The truncation is on the internal uh, primary sum. So if I divide the, this by the overall four point function, 
that is equivalent to, say, to be saying that the special function minus y0, 0, 0 is the negative. <coughs> so uh, in other words, y0, 0, 0 uh, is a lower bound on the spectral function. So I do this once for every delta star. Um, so if I can do this, I will find a lower bound, which, is, which will be a rigorous lower bound. It may not be optimal, depending on how many of these YMNs I include here. Yes? Y0, zero depends, maybe yes, yes, it will depend on delta star. So they say, given delta star, then you seek Y0, zero zero YMN, such that this is obeyed. Right. Um, and likewise, OK, so, um, and furthermore, um, uh, where is there so wet? <laughs> Does it all seem to be wet? <laughs> okay. Um, so um, uh, if then um, <coughs> uh, if I then uh, maximize uh, y zero zero subject to that inequality, uh, I will get uh, perhaps a optimal uh, lower bound. Um, f of delta star. Likewise, I can uh, minimize y0, 0, 0, subject to the opposite inequality, and I'll get a upper bound on the special function. OK, so, uh, so you might wonder, what kind of bound do you actually get, get in practice? Um, just to illustrate. Uh, how this works, uh, and discuss a very, very simple example, a toy example, before coming back to liberal theory. So uh, let's consider uh, uh, the following. So um, uh, let me truncate the, the sum to, to the following. Let me consider inequality just in the case, uh, and this is y0, 0, 0 minus y10, f10 over f00 zero zero, uh, minus y01, zero one, f01 zero one over f00. Zero zero. Uh, consider this inequality. Um, so what does this thing look like? Um, let me use a very stupid approximation of the conformal block. So I know that this f, the function of z, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, the external operator is, uh, has some weight h phi. Uh, the, the first OP coefficient is 2 minus 2 h phi plus h. That's where the first internal primer appears. And then with higher powers in the z expansion. So let me do a stupid approximation where I just throw away the higher order terms in Z and just use this and see what happens. So this is sometimes called a scaling block. Uh, now I can't really uh, replace the block by the scaling block uh, because uh, uh, I mean I could try to expand uh, this function in that, but uh, uh, then there's no guarantee that the coefficients are positive. Um, but let me nonetheless use this approximation for now, which is valid sometimes, uh, which is a uh, which which is qualitatively correct sometimes. Um, if I do this, uh, then it is clear that if I take derivative with, with respect to z, there's also f bar, okay, and if I take derivative with, with respect to z uh, and evaluate z equals one half, uh, I just um, post down this, uh, this 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 exponent here. So in this case, I would get f one zero divided by f zero zero would be um, <coughs> uh, in fact twice from the factor of one half from z equals one half uh, minus two h five plus h. <coughs> Right, and um, uh, in fact, and similarly, this would be the same thing involving h tilde. So let me further even assume 
let me define y, take y, y10 uh, to be, uh, choose y10 to be equal to y01 to be, uh, let's say, call it y1. Um, and this uh, equation then would be, and it, with this uh, very naive approximation, would be of the form uh, y00 minus, let's say, y1 uh, times uh, some, um, let's say, 2y1 minus 2 delta phi plus delta, where the delta is the total dimension <coughs> greater than or equal to 0. Uh, F was uh, the, the, the chiral, the, the holomorphic part, and uh, then there's anti-holomorphic part. This, remember, was the product of the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so I get this. Uh, and uh, then you can draw a picture and see how this works. So um, I, I, I want to, uh, the, the name of the game is, so, so suppose I didn't impose any condition, any assumption on the CFT. So this delta, which is obey the entirety bound, let's say, is uh, non-negative. Um, and then, I need this thing to hold for given delta star. I need this thing to hold for all delta for some choice of the y's. So how does that work? Um, this y0,0 zero, zero is supposed to be a lower bound on a special function. And of course, I could take it to be negative, but then that's an empty statement, because the special function ranges from 0 to 1. So I better want to, I want to take y0,0 zero, zero to be positive, uh, between 0 and 1, hopefully. Um, so uh, let's say here is delta star. Uh, this step function, take, you know, let's say this is 1. So th the step function takes uh, this form, that's, this, that's the theta. Uh, and uh, uh, if I uh, subtract it off by y0,0, zero, zero, I will lower it by some amount like this. Uh, and then uh, I want to add to it something like this. Um, so here, uh, let's say maybe this is 2 delta phi. Um, and um, uh, this is some linear function in delta that crosses uh, zero over here. Uh, and so I can take some, uh, let's say, some function like this. Uh, oh, maybe. Okay. L like so. Uh, and so it's negative here and positive here. And I choose it so that it cancels against this so that it now it's positive everywhere. Okay. So this is an example. Uh, so obviously, as you adjust this, uh, you know, the, this, this, this bound will change. Um, I don't really care the value of y1, I just want to choose y1 to ensure this inequ uh, inequality is obeyed, and y0,0 zero, zero is this shift. Okay, so, so this, anyway, this cannot, be, cannot be arbitrarily negative, otherwise, uh, you know, the, 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 I, mean, I have to ensure that this is bigger than this, and I have to ensure that this is bigger than this. Okay, so you can, in, in this way you can derive uh, some kind of bound. Uh, in fact, um, uh, what you will find uh, in this case is the following. Um, <coughs> ah. uh, what, you, what you find is that in this case, uh, the lower bound y0,0 zero, zero is, uh, as a function of delta star, uh, is basically, uh, because of this approximation, it is basically uh, 1 minus 2 delta phi uh, over delta star. <coughs> Uh, so that actually by itself is a, it's a, a slightly uh, amusing result uh, because it says that it tells us that um, there, if this approximation is valid, of course it's not quite correct, but you can correct this. So qualitatively it's, it's correct. So if, if you can trust this approximation of the component block, then you would say that special function um, has to be uh, bounded from below by some uh, function like one, 1 minus 1 over delta star, something like this. Okay. Uh, this actually is, uh, uh, well, this, this hold would hold everywhere, but um, asymptotically for large delta star, of course, it tells you that the contribution from, from higher and higher dimensional operators to this formal fun function will be smaller and smaller. Um, so it'll give you an estimate of the tail contribution. Uh, unfortunately, this, this estimate is not very good. Uh, it's not a very strong uh, constraint on the, in the large weight limits because, as I argued yesterday, very quickly, uh, um, that... Uh, uh, the OP convergence was actually exponential. So if a sufficiently large dimension, um, the, uh, um, the convergence of the component block sum will be exponential. This will give only a power law convergence, which is much weaker. But nonetheless, it's an untrivial result you can derive just from uh, this very simple analysis here. Any questions about this? Uh, that it goes like 1 over delta star. This, is, this says that, see, this is lower bound on the special function, which uh, asymptotes to 1. So if it's 
uh, one minus a small number, it tells you that the contribution from operator dimension above, above delta star is suppressed by this number. But I'm saying that this bound is actually rather weak because the actual optimal bound, for, at least for sufficiently, hard, sufficiently large dimension, will be exponential. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, now, if you um, and now if you do this maximization or minimization procedure um, with all the uh, higher order derivatives, um, you know, m and n, taken into account, uh, you, well, you get stronger bounds. But uh, of course, you know, so far we only know how to do this numerically. And numerically, this can be done using uh, semi-definite programming. Uh, and there's some computer, uh, nice computer packages uh, for this. Uh, the one that is most commonly used in this context is the package written by David Simmons Stephen uh, called uh, um, SD, SDPB. Uh, this name stands for, uh, well, it might stand for Simmons Stephen, but actually stands for semi-definite programming, and uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, B, because there, there was an A uh, previously, so this is an uh, improvement on that. Um, uh, so, sorry, is it, is it obvious that as we put more terms, we put more with uh, yes, uh, that is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, b because you can always choose the YMS to be zero uh, if, you, if you like to. Yeah, so, so, so that, that, that is clear. Um, the question is how, how, how far can you push this down? Now that depends on what condition you impose. You see, if you make some assumption on the spectrum, uh, you would restri make restrictions on H and H tilde. So you have fewer inequalities, then you have stronger, you have stronger bounds. And you, 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 you'll be able to push this bound to, uh, to uh, to higher, for the low bound to, to, to higher value. Um, so um, I can't do this uh, numerical optimization in real time in the lecture. Yes? Um, well, so first of all, I should say that um, uh, under some uh, assumption of analyticity, uh, doing the Taylor expansion is, is good enough. Uh, because we know that these things are supposed to be analytic functions um, in the neighborhood of uh, z equals one half. Um, now, uh, there's a question of numerical efficiency, and there are uh, different ways to do this. You can, you can take arbitrary uh, linear functional um, on the space of functions in z and z bar. You can, instead of taking derivative, you can integrate with the kernel. It just happens that numerically, this seems to be the most efficient way to do it so far. But uh, perhaps analytically, it's not uh, very good for some purposes. For example, here we already saw an example. So um, uh, here, the, by using the derivatives, uh, you get a bound that is actually rather weak uh, for, for, the, for the purpose of binding the tail contribution. And there's actually a, a clear reason why it is weak. Because um, yesterday, when I discussed the exponential bound, uh, it was important to use the convergence of the uh, control block expansion uh, near q equals 1. Um, and then you go to smaller q, you get uh, exponential convergence. Um, here, I'm expanding around uh, a different point, which is z equals 1 half, which actually corresponds to q equals e to the minus pi, which is a tiny number, so it's kind of far away from that. And if you can somehow approach that, you'll get a stronger bound for this particular purpose. OK. Um, uh, so uh, now, um, so I cannot do this in real time. This takes some work on the uh, cluster with the sort of th thousands of cores. And uh, then we wait for a week. You get some results. Um, so uh, I'll just tell you what the result look like, looks like in this case. Uh, I think uh, at least Silva Pufu will uh, also tell you about the application of uh, the semi definite program me method in many other uh, conformal bootstrap problems, so, so probably in more detail. Um, so, um, uh, so if you assume uh, only scalars, only sort of scalar versus sort of primaries, uh, which actually is a very strong condition, uh, as we have seen, uh, it fixes the spectrum entirely, um, and so forth. Um, and what you find is the following. So you have some plot of uh, this delta star special function. So of course, uh, in order doing this, you have to, to pick uh, some values of uh, standard charge c. You pick the uh, external operator dimension. Um, and then you, you, you do this bound, um, 0 and, and 1. Um, and uh, so you would. Uh, uh, find some, uh, let's say, uh, upper bound, uh, starting from some value of n, like n equals 3. And you, you, you increase n, you find uh, stronger bounds, like so. 
so all of this will be excluded. So this will be some kind of upper bound. And, um, and then you find some lower bound like this. Uh, and this will be ex excluded. And um, it turns out that as you increase, sorry, if you, so suppose you um, truncate this up to some integer n, and then take n to be bigger and bigger, um, you will get uh, a stronger and stronger uh, upper and lower bounds, uh, like so, uh, narrowing down some uh, small window uh, of the possible uh, value of special functions. So if you have some CFT that obey the property, uh, the special function must be somewhere in between. Uh, and if you actually, so it turns out this numerical convergence is fairly slow, and uh, we cannot push this window to be to be too small. But uh, if you actually uh, calculate the special function of Liouville theory using um, just numerically using the this very complicated DOZZ formula for the OP coefficients and using um, the recursion relation I described last time to compute the conform blocks, uh, you will find the special function basically lies right in between in this window. So this is Liouville. Um, so conjecturally, uh, one might hope that if you push uh, this uh, uh, numerics, let's say, to higher order, this might actually converge to this bound. It's a little hard to see uh, with the current uh, numerical technology, uh, but there's another way to uh, arrive at the same result uh, that is uh, perhaps more convincing numerically. I'll just mention that very, very briefly. Um, um, uh, that, that is the following. So, um, um, <coughs> Uh, if you look at uh, these two inequalities that give rise to uh, upper and lower bounds, um, of course, a, a priori, this, this bound, of course, will not coincide. If they coincide, they will pin down the special function. But in this case, we do expect to, to pin down the special function. So um, uh, that would happen if, uh, uh, you know, for example, you could anticipate that if you can solve the equality instead of the inequality uh, for some set of y's. Uh, then the upper and lower bounds will coincide. Uh, so in that case, so you, you might try to find um, a set of y0,0 zero zero and ymn such that the equality is satisfied. Now, for the inequality, you have to truncate on the n. If you only have to solve the equality, you have to take n to infinity. So that's, um, you have to take that limit. But um, you can nonetheless truncate uh, on this n and uh, view this, well, you can view this as a um, equation on, um, uh, uh, on the space of functions in the weights. Um, <coughs> and you can, uh, with some appropriate uh, inner product on the space of weights, say the, the positive real line in this case, um, you, the, the space of, you can consider a suitable class of space of functions um, that spans some Hilbert space. And um, uh, you pick an appropriate basis for that Hilbert space, of the, which is the space function of the weights, and take the inner product of this equation with that basis and make some truncation. You can solve. Uh, this uh, set of equations uh, just by solving some uh, big linear equation and extract the coefficients y0,0. Zero, zero, uh, and you can ask whether that solution for y0,0 zero, zero will be stable with respect to um, increasing the truncation on the basis. Um, it's a little bit of a technical thing, and um, I don't want to discuss that in its entire detail. There's some discussion of this in the lecture notes. Uh, I'll just tell you what the result looks like. The result of that uh, is um, you'll find, you know, directly solve y0,0. Zero, zero, uh, and you'll find some uh, uh, um, uh, some solution that kind of oscillates a little bit here and basically merges down to the Liouville special function. Um, so in this way of uh, so, so that's basically uh, in some sense a direct numerical solution to the crossing equation in this case, um, and that heavy, heavily relies on the fact that uh, on the uh, uh, assumption that the upper and lower bounds uh, do uh, eventually agree as you optimize, um, uh, as you take this n to infinity and optimize the, the bound. Um, but this way of solving it, uh, so first of all, kind of the convergence is more convincing uh, because it kind of numerically agrees very well. You can see uh, that the plots in um, uh, our uh, uh, paper on this from uh, February, I think, um, or March, I forgot, maybe February. Um, uh, in this way of solving it, uh, in fact, uh, this, this wiggles, which will eventually settle down as you increase 
the uh, numerical precision by including, say, higher order terms in the um, uh, higher order terms in the uh, truncation on the, on the order of the Q expansion of the Virachow component blocks. Uh, this this wiggles indicates that in this way of solving it, um, the special function solution is not uh, manifestly monotonic. So in fact, I have not used um, in this way of solving it, I would not uh, have used uh, unitarity. So unitarity implies that the, the uh, what we conventions are positive, positive uh, or the negative, so the function is monotonic. Uh, but here, I don't even need that assumption. I can just directly solve um, this uh, equality and um, and get the result of y zero zero, which matches on with the Liouville special function. So that would, I would say is a numerical evidence that in fact the uh, DOZZ formula is a unique solution to the crossing equation. That was the question earlier. <coughs> uh, so do you think that we go through the severe if you impose these positivity? Oh, no, I mean, and the, the wiggles settle down. Um, uh, I mean, I, I can do various things, but I'm saying that th these wiggles will settle down, uh, will, will disappear we'll as I increase the numerical precision. Okay. So, okay. So, 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 I mean, I'm just saying that to some, in fact, I'm exaggerating that the actual wiggle is even smaller. So. Um, uh, as we uh, actually, uh, it depends on the uh, uh, very much. It's very much sensitive to the order of the Q truncation on the order of the Q expansion in the Kamov block. Actually, so if you don't go the very truncation, to if you don't do the truncation to very high order, you get some huge oscillations, and uh, and then eventually settles down. Yes. 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 Uh, yes, but uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but I'm s what I'm s saying is that so in deriving the bounds, of course, I've assumed unitarity that was es essential. <coughs> but I'm saying that this other way of solving it, uh, solving directly the special function by solving the equality rather than inequality, for that I do not use the positivity assumption. <coughs> yes. It's equivalent, as I already said. The information of the function is completely equivalent to the OP coefficient. You just take the derivative of this with back to the truncation level, truncation dimension delta star. You, get a, you read off the OP coefficient. Yes. But uh, the other way of solving the, the solving the uh, positive, no. Uh, no, C you always enter in the component block, of course. Uh, Sorry, what, which C? Oh. oh. Uh, the, 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 those c squared, no, the, that, that's correct. The, the, they never, the, they never enter. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 that, that's correct. So, uh, um, yeah, I'm saying if, if I have a, if I have an equality, uh, I will get the statement that y zero zero is equal to a special function at delta star without assuming the positivity of c squared. Yes. So if there, if there happened, to, if there were multiple. Uh, uh, the typically, what would happen is that there would be no solution rather than there are mac, um, multiple solutions. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, I'm not sure. If well, so what, what no, no. The, 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 the logic was that the upper and lower bounds pin down the spectral function. Uh, so there's a unique spectral function. If there's a unique sp spectral function, I take its derivative with back to delta star. I get OP coefficients up to overall scaling. So in that sense, it uniquely fixes OP coefficients. That's why I say it's a unique solution to across the equation. Uh, there can be some degeneracy. That's a very good point. That is a caveat in this uh, argument I've presented so far. And uh, conjecturally, we believe that the only possibility, possible way to get around the degeneracy is to take a Liouville theory, a tensor with a topological quantum field theory. And there was a section in our paper that discussed that possibility, but let me not get into that here. Yes? Derivation from the under assumption of the only scalar primary? I'm not sure if that's the only assumption needed.
Yeah, I mean, that's essentially how the OZD formula was derived in the first place. Um, let's see, the, um, the Coulomb gas approximation is a big, big assumption. That's a big assumption. Yeah, I mean, you can try various things. I mean, you can certainly try to establish that, but, uh, you know, th there's, there's much more, there's much more input to Yeah, but, but the, the, the argument essentially makes some assumption about the, the, the underlying descript Lagrangian description is uh, involved with the one scalar field. The other continuation, first of all, is a funny thing because uh, you can't maintain the, um, if, if you just only continue the external operators arbitrarily, you cannot uh, maintain crossing symmetry if you maintain the spectrum of internal primaries. That is true, but I mean, there's there's a lot that go into that argument. We can we can discuss this later. But there's a lot that go into that argument. For example, uh, the OP coefficients have a bunch of poles, and if you want to continue arbitrarily the external operator dimension, some of the poles will cross the contour, and uh, uh, the cross equation will no, no, no longer hold unless you include some extra contributions, uh, the residue contributions. So uh, that that is. Uh, Uh, we can discuss later whether it's actually a proof based on this assumption, but uh, I've emailed with uh, Teschner and he certainly has, has not claimed that he has a proof of this. We can discuss the validity of these actual assumptions later. <laughs> Um, uh, it turns out that um, the, the, the same conclusion will hold uh, if you assume that the spin of primaries is bounded. Uh, so just assumption that spin of primaries is in a bounded range up to say 100, it turns out that the modular invariance would already kill any other possibility other than only scalar primaries. It's not obvious, but we have a proof in the paper. So, uh, so the statement is that every CFT that's not the real theory would actually have uh, necessarily have uh, versal primaries of all spins. I mean, unbounded spins at least. Um, okay. Um, um, now, uh, the the next thing I want to discuss, uh, which I guess I won't uh, really finish, but we can continue for a bit on Friday. Um, um, is uh, uh, to use the similar technique to constrain uh, general 2D CFTs. Uh, but of course, before that, I need to review uh, what's actually known about 2D CFTs, uh, what sort of classification we have. So um, I won't, certainly won't have the time to go through each of the known 2D CFT in detail, but I'm going to spend five minutes describing uh, the class of known CFTs and then, take the, uh, then spend the rest of the time taking questions. Um, so, <coughs> okay, so, um, a, uh, let's say a brief survey of known uh, 2D CFTs, uh, I'll assume unitarity for the most part. Okay. Uh, we have seen, uh, or at least mentioned, uh, min minimal model, so I'll come to that in, in a second. Uh, so the first class of theory you might want to consider are free theories. 
uh, but in, the, in 2D, uh, at least let's say if we want to start with the cl nicest class of theories, which are, which are compact CFTs, uh, you can't quite take the free boson by itself. Um, you have to take you have to take the compact you, know, you have to take the compact free boson. So the, the, the field X will be kind of periodically identified. Um, but the more general version of that is the Nere lattice uh, CFT. Um, so uh, you have some uh, signature n comma m lattice, uh, which is even and unimodular. Uh, so that defines a general um, uh, free boson CFT with the left center charge equal to n and right center charge equal to m. Um, uh, if you want to impose uh, strict modular invariance, you will need to impose c minus c tilde to be an integer module with module 24. Um, but you can relax that assumption. Um, so this describes a large class of uh, essentially theories, which are free bosons, but with some intricate details on which, which are, are, are the allowed uh, primary, uh, very short primaries. Uh, you'll probably see uh, more of this in the lectures on moonshine. Um, OK, so as I said, I'll, I'll just go through a list, and you can ask questions later uh, after I'm done with the list. Uh, so uh, given a CFT, we can do orbifolds. So you have some CFT with, uh, uh, say, uh, symmetry, discrete symmetry, let's say, discrete uh, symmetry group G. Uh, you can uh, gauge that symmetry and produce an orbital theory. Uh, that you can do for the Lorraine lattice uh, CFT, for example. You can, um, uh, you can find some symmetry of the lattice uh, or the some symmetry of the CFT based on this lattice. Uh, and, and consider uh, gauging that symmetry. Uh, this is actually a generally a well-defined procedure. Um, and um, uh, it produces a new, new CFT. Uh, for example, a specific Nurean lattice of signature 24, 0 uh, called a Leach lattice. If you do a Z2 overflow, you produce the so-called monster CFT, which uh, plays an essential role in the um, monstrous moonshine story. Um, you can Uh, okay, good. Uh, I was going to. Uh, um, okay, this, uh, I was going to answer questions on this later, but let me just ex say a few words now. So, so the idea is basically the following. Uh, uh, let's start with. Uh, so, consider a torus partition function. All right. Um, now, uh, uh, if you consider um, the uh, original CFT on the spatial circle. You can twist it by an element of the symmetry group uh, just by inserting that uh, uh, charge, um, the, the symmetry ch charge on the uh, uh, on, on the torus uh, uh, partition function. Uh, so the the spatial direction is untwisted. I call it uh, digit you know, by identity. So it's untwisted. It's twisted in the g direction. Um, so this thing is well defined uh, given the original CFT because all I need to know is how the Group act element act on the states. If I perform a modular transformation, I'll produce this one, which tells me the spectrum of the G twisted sector. So this was something that would have to be included in the spectrum. Now, uh, generally, um, the way I want to think about, or I can think about this uh, action by G, is that it introduces a what one, what one could call a topological line operator. It winds around uh, some loop. Uh, on the uh, surface, uh, on the Riemann surface, on which the CFT is defined. And uh, we, the definition of this is you cut it open, and you, uh, um, you, um, you cut open the Riemann surface. You have the space of CFT on the circle. You act on it with element of G, and then you glue it back. Uh, and it's the, the, the fact that the G is a symmetry is equivalent to a statement that this thing is topological in the sense that you can move it around without changing the answer. OK. But, uh, but uh, to, get the full, uh, to get, get the full answer, you have to know uh, something like uh, G here and H here. Um, that's a little trickier. And to do this um, requires some much more work. You have to analyze the full-point function. So you can analyze uh, some twisted uh, sector operator. So this thing, this operator itself, uh, will come with a, um, with a uh, will be will come with a this topological line operator attached to it. So it's some G1 and G2, uh, like so. And this will be some G1, G2 inverse, and and maybe some G3 and G4. 
this full point function of the twisted uh, operators would exist, provided that the product g1, g2, g3, g4 is equal to 1. And again, by applying crossing, uh, you will be able to uh, go from, uh, let's say, this is just 1, so g, uh, g inverse, maybe um, h, h inverse, uh, h, h inverse. You can, by crossing, you can produce g, h, uh, g, h inverse, the general uh, OP coefficients, right, like so. Uh, and uh, then by going through some particular channel, taking some particular OP limit, you can actually produce this. So uh, there's um, a slightly elaborate procedure in general. Uh, in practice, uh, this is actually com quite a cumbersome to carry out. People have other clever ways to compute in, in special cases. But th that's roughly how it goes. Uh, no, uh, I, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But this is uh, this is getting my discrete symmetry, so it, it's a little different. It's not Lagrangian description is not particularly helpful for this for describing the gauging. Uh, I should say that sometimes the gauging will be will suffer from Tufta anomalies. So um, so even though the symmetry is a good symmetry, if you gauge it, it suffers from some kind of discrete gauge anomaly, uh, and that can be de detected by seeing that um, uh, if you start with this, this character, you may get end up with something that's not consistent with the expected modular property. So th this can happen. Yes? So are we thinking of orbital in the sense that we take, we want to take our operators and make it like e plus equivariant, and then we sort of, just like we do in like normal, uh, we can like the string theory in our orbital. Uh, I mean, this is uh, the, the same as that, um, I w but I want to describe in the language without ever referring to Lagrangian. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, okay. So um, the next class of um, examples are, um, WZW and uh, uh, coset models. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what this is is that um, uh, the different way to, to think about this. Um, uh, either uh, okay, so since I'm, I have no time right now, so uh, uh, it, you can think of a nonlinear signal model on a uh, target space, which itself is some Lie group uh, G. Um, in practice, for the entirety, this needs to be semi-simple, um, and um, uh, with some uh, uh, non-trivial, well, w w with some non-trivial coupling, which uh, I, I don't want to. I, I, okay, let, let's say. I'll just, just say with, with H flux. If you want to know what H flux is, you have to look at uh, the lecture notes or Pochinsky. Um, um, uh, it defines a, a class of uh, 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 CFTs with some uh, continuous symmetry, uh, G, which is associated with some uh, not occurrence. Uh, I can call them J, A, Z, and uh, J tilde, A, Z bar. Um, and so uh, there's some, uh, these current turn, turn out to be uh, separately holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, separately conserved, um, and that um, uh, enlarges the um, Versor symmetry to a bigger symmetry known as the current algebra. Uh, there's G times G current algebra, That's right. uh, which roughly speaking is associated with the left and right uh, group action on the, uh, on the Lie group. So you have uh, when you sumo, sumo on, on the Lie group, you have left and right action giving, giving rise to two sets of not occurrence, but each one is actually enhanced to so infinite set of not occurrence because they are purely holomorphic, just like the Versoro. Um, so this defines a class of CFT. Uh, uh, so, th so typically we call these uh, G hat K. Um, uh, theories, let's say, uh, they involve the G hat K current algebra K is also called level, uh, which is, uh, I won't, uh, I don't have time to write a definition of this, but uh, uh, it's some, typically some uh, positive integer, and the central charge of this theory is K times the dimension of the group divided by K plus H G, where H G is the dual cluster number of that Lie group. Uh, never mind the details, the point of this formula is that in a large K limit, this looks like a classical theory on the, uh, on the target space, looks like uh, the, um, 
the sum chart will approach the dimension of the group, which is the uh, number of uh, 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 bosons that describe, um, well, that are in this linear sig sigma model Lagrangian. But uh, if k is uh, finite or small, there's uh, some uh, interaction that makes, makes the chart smaller. Um, and if you're given this group G, uh, this WCLV model, which is defined on CFT, you can uh, gauge a uh, subgroup H uh, and produce the so-called gauged WCLV model, uh, which uh, also is also called the COSAT model. And there is an intrinsic uh, kind of CFT description of what is that uh, uh, theory you, you obtain by gauging this. Um, and uh, it's a rather elaborate story. I don't have time to describe it in this in detail. Um, I, it suffices to say that um, this produces a very large class of theories, which includes uh, the minimal models we mentioned and much more. Um, and uh, uh, this entire set of cosine models fall into the class of, of so-called uh, rational conformal field theory. Um, uh, sorry, rational, rational conformal field theory. A rational conformal field theory is, roughly speaking, uh, I'll just finish um, in two minutes. Um, uh, uh, roughly speaking, rational conformal field theory, uh, what it is, is that uh, you have some extra conserved currents that enlarge the Virasoro algebra. Uh, uh, so you have a, a bigger, purely holomorphic um, uh, operator algebra. Um, the, if it's, if all the operators are purely holomorphic, it's very constraining. Uh, and the other operators can be organized now into a representation of not just the Virasoro algebra, but a, bu a bigger uh, holomorphic uh, vertex algebra. Um, and the key assumption in the rational CFT is that uh, as representation with back to this bigger algebra, uh, there are only a finite, there are only finitely many uh, primaries, or finitely many irreducible representations. Uh, if that bigger algebra is in the Virasoro algebra itself, uh, the only example of rational CFT would be the minimal models, where you only have a finite, finitely many uh, Virasoro primaries. Uh, but this is more general. Uh, the uh, WZW model, for example, uh, viewed, if you organize the upper spectrum as representations of the Virasoro algebra, there's still infinitely many primaries. But if you organize them into representations with that the current algebra, which includes, uh, includes the Virasoro algebra as a subalgebra, then you only have finitely many irreducible representations. The rational CFT have some special property. All the weights are, uh, are rational numbers, and the central charge also is a, is a rational number that can be shown. Um, and um, apart from these, uh, the other class of known CFTs are based on, uh, or have, uh, uh, that are kind of robust, uh, have robust constructions, or have uh, super symmetries, so super conformal theories. And uh, since I shouldn't be going over time uh, too, by too much, I will, I will stop now, and maybe we'll continue for a little bit more uh, tomorrow. Uh, they are generally not unitary, uh, so L0 cannot be diagonalized, so then, yeah. If you're about unitarity, you can enlarge these constructions. Uh, but, but as far as I know, I think the examples are still very limited. I mean, they're, they're typically based on some kind of either free theory or something. Uh, good. Uh, so at one point, uh, maybe sometime uh, in, in the 80s, um, uh, there was an effort in trying to classify rational conformal field theories. Um, there are different things you could mean by classification. I think to some extent, uh, some people just try to classify the possible operator spectrum. But what we know that the operator spectrum actually does not determine uh, the, 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 the theory. There are um, you know, theories with identical upper spectrum but different OP coefficients. So I would say that we're actually very, very far from classifying rational CFTs. Um, it, usually one categorizes rational CFTs by how many irreducible representations with back to this bigger holomorphic vertex algebra there are in the theory. And the simplest case, you would say that it would just have one uh, single representation. So the entire CFT will be a holomorphic vertex algebra. So this can happen if, uh, let's say, the central charge is equal to uh, 24k, and maybe C tilde is equal to zero. So this will be purely holomorphic CFT, uh, sometimes usually called a mer meromorphic CFT, uh, where k is uh, integer, that is positive integer, 
Um, and um, so this will give the simplest class of rational CFDs in the sense that there's only one irreducible representation of vertex, vertex algebra. Uh, but even this is far from being classified. Uh, so uh, I guess in the k equals one case, it is uh, classified. But for k greater than uh, one, it's very, very far from being classified. Uh, these? Uh, okay, so first of all, l l let me clarify the language a little bit. Uh, so uh, whenever I speak of CFT, I want to impose strict modular invariance. Uh, so invariance of prime function and the tau to tau plus one. Um, so if I impose that, I would uh, only allow integer spin operators. Uh, so now you might say that I would uh, exclude all super conformal field theories because th the supercurrent always have half integer spin. Uh, but in fact, there's a standard construction that produces a fully modular invariant theory in the strict sense from a one with half interest in current known as a GSO projection. So I take a super conformal theory, I do a GSO projection, I produce a something we might call bosonic, but I didn't, I don't want to use the word bosonic just because, you know, these are just all CFTs. Uh, so when I, when I speak of a classification, I'm referring to a classification that includes super conformal theories. So if you have a super conformal the theory, even though the GSO projection will kill the spin three halves supercurrent, there'll be a generally, for example, there could be a spin three current made of a pair, uh, normal order of the, the super uh, spin three halves supercurrent, and that will survive a GSO projection. So that will still give rise to a enlarged um, um, uh, holomorphic uh, operator algebra beyond the Sorrow. Maybe you have spin three, spin four, and so forth, even if they don't have spin three halves. Uh, so w when I speak of a classification, I would want to would like to include those, uh, uh, of course, uh, as, as well. No, I haven't exhausted my list yet. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm out, out of time. So <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. Uh, <laughs>